Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning, brothers and sisters, friends and family. It's good to be here again sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Welcome to our Sunday ministration. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. My name is Pastor Femi Alara of Living in the World International Church, a place where we preach Christ undiluted and we receive the keys to fulfill our destinies. And I pray that you shall fulfill your destiny in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time this month, Happy New Month to you. And I bring you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Last month, we looked at a subject of... Um, the secret place and this month we're looking at the subject of intimacy i remember the last sermon of last month was talking about building an altar an altar is a place where you offer praise sacrifice you offer your thanksgiving your your worship but that can only be done in the secret because the god that sees in the secret will reward you openly but you see relationship is the bedrock for answer prayers many of us oftentimes we struggle with having a relationship because we're simply not committed to God. We are like a, a boyfriend dating a lady that only wants the goodies but does not want to actually commit to a long-term affair, i.e. take her to the altar and put a ring on her finger. Or you're like a patient that only goes and see the doctor only when he's sick, not, nothing else. You have no relationship with your doctor. Or like an ATM machine that you goes out to withdraw money only when you need money, but you never visit the ATM machine again. Relationship is the bedrock for answer prayers. It's something that has been so important, that is so important that you and I really understand. Now, Growing in Intimacy is our series of teaching for the month. And as we begin to examine the different aspects of intimacy, one of the things you will come to understand is that God is a God of value relationship. No matter how powerful he is, and we know God is powerful. I mean, we don't have to discuss that in depth. We know God is powerful. He's all powerful. Yet he left his throne in Genesis to go and visit man in the cool of the day. Yet he left his throne and he came into the world as a man to die for the sin of humanity. That tells us that he is very particular about relationships. Many of us are yet to really understand the, God, the, the value that God plays on relationship. And I'm praying that through this series of teaching this month, that you'll begin to see God from a different perspective. Understanding Him that He wants intimacy with you. The different kind of relationship that God talks about in the Bible. The Bible calls our maker, our husband, in the books of Isaiah 54, I think verse 5. He calls Him our God. He calls Him our Savior. He calls Him our Redeemer. He calls him our friend. There are all kinds of relationships that you can have with God. You are the person that will determine how close you get with God. In James chapter 4 verse 8, the Bible says, Draw near me, I will draw near you. If you ever feel God is far away, then you must ask yourself who moved away. It's not God because it's a constant. It must be you. Now I'm praying that this morning that God will open your eyes of understanding. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now shall we pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and glory and we give you praise and adoration. We worship your holy name for your faithfulness. You are good and your mercies endure forever. You are the almighty God. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. All you have uh, done for us last month, how you have brought us safely into the new month. Thank you for the goodness that we have enjoyed in the land of the living. Thank you for the blessings that we have not deserved but yet you have released unto us. Thank you for protecting our life. Thank you for keeping COVID-19 away from our home and every form of sickness and diseases. Thank you for protecting us and thank you for your name that's been glorified in our lives. My Savior, my God, this morning as we sit at your feet to hear your word, we ask that you will please open our eyes of understanding, that you reveal your perfect counsel to us, to the glory and praise of your holy name. Thank you, Savior, because I know you hear us always. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Now, growing in intimacy, part two. And we're looking at the subject this morning, He Always Provides. When you know somebody's character, you can rely and depend upon them. When you know somebody's character, you can rely and depend upon them. A lack of integrity on somebody's part means that you can't trust them to do what they have said they would do. When somebody has constantly broken their promise, then you know you, they simply are not reliable. Oftentimes, we use the phrase, God is too faithful to fail. That means his character is dependable. His integrity is intact. And God will never deny his word. Whatever he has said he would do, surely he would do it. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, not a son of man that he should repent. Whatever he said he would do, surely he would do it. So that gives us a bedrock for which we can start working. Now, a man does not go to the altar with a woman that he cannot trust. 
Because oftentimes I've told my wife the person that can get close to me to afflict me or hurt me the most is not people from outside, it's my wife. Because we sleep on the same bed. Now, I won't marry somebody I don't trust. That is number one. Now, God does not get in bed, in quote, with somebody he cannot trust. And you will not get in bed with God if you cannot trust him. The only reason why you have surrendered your life to Jesus as the altar and the finish of your, finish of your faith, I mean, i.e. salvation, is because you trust him enough with your life. And oftentimes I ask Christians, if you trust God with your life, why do you struggle to trust him with your money? When they tell you about tithes and offering and sowing sacrificial seed. It's sometimes it's baffling, it's mind baffling. Now, to put that aside, he always provides. That's something that we learn from the story of Abraham, the patriarchs of faith. Now, in the books of Genesis 22, verse 14, the Bible says, So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What that means is that God is always, at a, is always ready to supply our needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. God reveals different names to different people at different times of their lives, showing them that he is God, regardless of whatever they faced. I mean, if you read the books of Exodus chapter 17, we learn the name of God, the Jehovah Nisi, the, the Lord my banner. And that tells us something particularly about God in terms of protecting us against the affliction of the enemy. Because that name came as a result of them having victory over the Amalekites. Now, something about the name he will provide, it gives us an assurance about God's sufficiency. Many of us, when we go out and about our business, we sing the song every day, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. And when we sing the song, we sing it just as a, a cliche, not as a principle of something that we have followed. Now, God will provide is when you get into a hard place of life. The bills are coming in left, right and center. I mean, your income does not match the expenses that's in your way. Your mortgage is due, your council tax is due, the electricity bill is due, the car insurance is due, the children need this and that from school, and so on and so forth. But he tells you, I will provide. The examples in the scriptures gives us plenty of uh, assurance that God is able to meet the needs of, of, of his children. I mean, we read the story of... Uh, of um, Exodus and the children of Israel coming out of the land of bondage, they began to murmur in the wilderness and God supplied manna. I mean, they said, well, we are eating manna, there's no meat. There's a God gave them quail. And you read the story of Samaria in the books of 2 Kings 7, and you read, they tell them, say, by this time tomorrow, even though there was famine, there will be abundance. And they said, no, nah, it won't happen, but God provide. Oh, that's a coincidence. You read the books of 1 Kings 17, and you read about the story of a man called, or the prophet called Elijah. And suddenly, he was giving food by ravens twice a day. So it's not a coincidence. He won in the morning, one in the evening. He gave, he gave him food. God will provide. He fed the 5,000 and there were still leftovers. God will provide. What that means is that we have a precedence on his character to tell us that God provides for his own. I'm rest assured on that. Something I've come to understand about God is this. When God wants to do something, he announces it. That I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And then he's going to do it. Now, sometimes those things are far-fetched. And I can understand because our mind is so little to comprehend how he will come to be. The example that we read earlier, or I talked about earlier, in the books of 2 Kings chapter 7, is a story of famine in the land. Now, when we talk about famine, I mean, most of us have never seen it and we've never experienced it. And I pray we never do. Famine is where there's complete drought and there's scarcity of food to the stage that people begin to eat themselves. Famine is like survival of the fittest. Famine is where anarchy begins to break out because people are hungry. A hungry man is an angry man, they say. Far worse than a lion. Famine is where animals go into hiding because they, they are running for their dear life because they know if they don't run for their dear life, they'll be eating for dinner that night. Famine is where we don't you begin to tell ourselves, oh, I don't like that food. Oh, that meat is not clean. Famine is where you see a rat running across the room and you will chase after it to get it because you want to eat dinner that night. Famine is a time where there is intense hunger. But yet, God spoke to the prophet. He said, within 24 hours, there will be abundance in the land. Now, 
to a natural man that is next to impossible that would not happen but yet God did it that tells me that his provision and his sufficiency even though he's announced it ahead of time he came to be whether or not you partake of it is a different bargain when God tells you he will make you great all you have to do is to rejoice in that promise because he has said it before time he will surely bring it to pass so that you don't be like those that foresaw it, saw it ahead, but they never partook of it. You read the books of um, Second Kings. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. This is something that you and I need to begin to look at intensely. Not from the perspective that we are asking God to supply our needs, but from, from the level of developing intimacy with Him. And rest assured in His name, in His presence. Rest assured in the relationship that we have so that we don't have to do something else. That's against his will. Many of us often find ourselves between an, uh, between the rock and a hard place because, and we feel that we have to always compromise because God has not come true for us. To be determined to obey God regardless of the consequences of the cost. Abraham is a story that we all love to share, but how many of us can walk in the footsteps of Abraham? Abraham was told. To sacrifice a son he has waited for for 25 years to a God <laughs> who seemed like he was very slow in answering that prayer. Sometimes when God gives us a promise, it seems like it's going to happen tomorrow, but he might be talking 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Most of the time when we hear a promise from God, all you have to do is to celebrate the, the promise and keep walking in line with his will because you don't know when he's going to fulfill it. You know he's going to do it one day, but you don't know when. There are people who God has spoken to, but because they lack the faith, the energy, the tenacity, the composure, the, the belief that he will come to pass, they have gone against the promises of God for their lives. The overjury God will provide he sees all things and he knows your need. Many of us lack gratitude because we are simply live, we live in a time and dispensation where we simply have everything at our beck and call. A child does not really understand the value of his parents until he moves outside his house. I always, I always tell my children and my, my wife and my, my family that I say a child does not understand or appreciate his parents. You know, especially when they get into their teenage years, they, they, they think they know more than their parents then. They have a better understanding of life than their parents do. They know everything about life, ministry, and everything else. So, oh, praise God. But you know, the funny thing is, the moment they move out of the house and they have to start paying their bill. Now, the, the miracle that they used to experience, their fridge is always stocked with food. There's always, you know, food in, in the fridge. There's juice, there's all kinds of things, biscuit and so on and so forth that they can actually take. But they realize that the moment they move out of the house and start living by, by themselves, they are unable to actually get those things. That tells me something. Many of us, because we have such a wonderful life, we've never had to make any hard choices. We seem to just, eh, God, God, God can live in heaven, we live on earth, when his time will come. And as a result of that, we have never been able to really rest in the assurance that God will provide. We have constantly compromised with the world. Let me say this, brothers and sisters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. There's nothing you're going through that you have somebody else has not experienced before. I'm sure none of us have experienced the fact that we have to go and sacrifice our child to God. So, I think that with a bit of um, a pinch of salt. But the things that you're going through in our modern day and dispensation, i.e. Um, paying bills, dealing with your, your delinquencies of children, uh, marital troubles and so on and so forth, that is common to man. Immigration status, that is common to man. There are plenty of people who have gone through the same thing before and have not compromised and yet God did it for them. Some of the obstacles that we face when it comes to God's provision is this. Self-sufficiency. I don't need God. What has God done for me? I'm a self-made millionaire. What has God done for me? I don't need God. 
Now, that is a challenge. Because then God stays his hand away from you. You know, you've heard the, you heard the phrase, heaven help those who help themselves. I, 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 I disagree with that statement. Heaven help those who have surrendered themselves unto God and say, Lord, I can't do it by my own strength. Abraham got to a stage where he knew, Genesis 22, you read the story entirety, he got to a stage he knew, I have to obey God, damn the consequence, I don't know how he's going to provide, but he would do it. Obstacles, self-sufficiency, I mean, we live in the West. I was describing to you the other day and I said, I can cook with 10 pounds and I can eat for a week with that. I mean, it won't be the most delicacy of food, but I can eat with a week, with 10 pounds. I said, how can you ask that possible? I said, believe me, I can stretch the budget and I will eat with 10 pounds a week. And I will eat well. Not necessarily all the delicacies, but I will eat. I said, that's, that's not possible. I, it is possible. In more than one way, it's possible. And with 10 pounds, you can stretch the budget that much. So as a result of that, the common man thinks to himself, well, I don't need God. I can eat three square meal a day. I have a roof over my head. I mean, I'm healthy. There's nothing else. If I go, if I feel ill, I walk straight into the hospital. By law, they will treat me. So what is the problem? Why do I have to come looking for a God as has never looked for me? And then, so naturally, that tends to move us towards disobedience, whether civil or whether moving towards complete opposite to what God wants us to do. So when they tell us, oh, pay tithes, you say, no, what do I need to pay tithes? I've been feeding, eating three square meal a day. So why do I need to pay tithes? An offering. Oh, God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. What devourer? I've been eating three square meal. What do I need to devourer for? I have a house. My car is working fine. Nothing's happened to me. So it's, it's difficult sometimes to see from that perspective because you're constantly thinking, I don't need God. I'm self-sufficient. The other thing is we lack contentment. And uh, this is one of the biggest obstacles as well. We, we lack contentment in the sense that we simply <laughs> want more than what God has proposed for us. I've often said this. Man, each man has a capacity. Some people are 25 liters. Some people are 20 liters. Some people are 50 liters. Some people are 100 liters. You must understand your capacity. And one of the prayers you can always pray is to ask God, Lord, increase my capacity. Because God does not like waste. If your capacity is still 20 liters and you keep trying to put in 100 liter worth of liquid into it, you're going to waste at least 80 of it. So what I'm trying to get across here is that we must also have the contentment, whatever level we are at. Paul said, I've learned to be contented in plenty, in little, in much. In whatever state I find myself, I've learned to be contented. If he has said he will bless you and make you great, if he has not done it now, be contented with where you are. Because when we lack contentment, we are often lured into sin to do things that we ought not to do or deeper handed things that we ought not to be found doing. Number three, we don't trust God's timing. One of the biggest obstacles to God's provision is that we don't trust his timing. We often will lean on our own understanding. Proverbs 3 verse 5, it said, lean not unto your understanding. In other ways, trust him. And acknowledge it. Lean not onto your own understanding. And you know, he will bless you in his own time. I've listened to a man of God this morning, just before I came out to preach this morning, is that he was talking about the seed time and harvest. He said, You don't plant a seed today and tomorrow it reap and harvest, which is common sense, but none of us ever actually imbibe those, those principles. So when God asks us to sow a seed today, it doesn't mean that tomorrow morning he will give us an harvest. If he chooses, he can do it. Something you must understand here is this. God has a timetable. He has a timetable to, to life, to godliness, to the things he wants to do for you. Now that that timetable is according to his own will, not yours. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Many of us often want our own will to be done, not his will. And as a result of that, we constantly go against his will for our lives. Number four. We lack gratitude. What have you done for me lately? First, First Timothy 4 verse 4. The Bible says, For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected, if it is received with thanksgiving. 
First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, In all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. For you, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I love that scripture. In all things give thanks. Many of us don't have, when was the last time you said, Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done? I can move my hand, I can move my leg, not because I'm strong and healthy, but because you have strengthened me. Thank you, Jesus. Most of us are yet to say thank you, even for last month, even though many people passed away. Since the pandemic began, a lot of people have lost their lives, lost loved ones. Have you said thank you for keeping your life unwell? I want you to understand something. You have a bright future, but if you fight against your greatest ally, which is God, you will find yourself at a disadvantage when you come, when you come against the enemies of your life. God is your strongest ally, and he has a, a motto of operandi, in other words, a way that he does things. Those that know me, well, I'm just giving myself an example, will know certain things about my character, and certain things I like, certain things I don't like. For example, I don't like using vulgar words. I don't like using vulgar languages around me. I don't like you saying things negative. Even when things look dire and dicey, still speak positive, speak life. And that gives, you know, that encourages me around you. Oh, I, I, that adheres me to you or make, you, make me feel comfortable around you. But if you're constantly using negative words and you constantly see doom and gloom, I will always want to just keep you at an arm's length, even further than that. One thing you must understand here is this. We all face challenges, regardless. But until your faith is tested, it cannot be trusted. Many people have untested faith, but yet they want the price of those who have been tested in their faith. Like I said earlier, how many of us will walk in the shoes of Abraham, given the chance to go and sacrifice our own son? Now, what's your own Isaac? Is it your job? Is it your career? Is it your home? Is it your money? Is it your car? What is God asking you to sacrifice? Because when he tests your faith, then, if you read that same Genesis 22 carefully, God sent an angel and said, ah, twice. You see, he said, I can't find anything greater than to swear that to swear by. I will swear by myself. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. Whoever fights you fights me. That's because he has gotten to a level of intimacy with God that he trusts him that he will do. He cannot betray him. Can God trust you that you will not betray him? The word test itself means to, to qualify through examination. That way, your faith becomes genuine because you can then see a life from a different perspective completely. There are people here who cannot even be loyal to their wives. They can't be loyal to their church. They can't be loyal to their pastor. And yet, you are saying they love the Lord. I wonder what kind of love they profess. He will provide means that you can rest assured that you don't have to compromise when it comes to God. Except you have something to hide. Except you have done something you ought not to do. He will provide. It means that he stands with you regardless. He will provide. He is the Almighty. He has all power and might in his hands. And he can reverse time if he wants to. So when whatever you think you have lost or what advantage you think you are about to lose as a consequence of obeying God, he can reverse it. That is something that's always in the forefront of my mind. That God can reverse it and he can replace and restore all that I have lost. Regardless, as long as I have obeyed him in entirety. Every one of us will have difficult choices to make. Right now some of us are in one. Some of us have just left one. Some of us are approaching one. Remember our life is a choice. Everything we do daily is a choice. I chose to be here this morning to preach the gospel. 
I could lay it on my bed and not get up. You can choose to eat, you can choose to drink, you can go to, choose to go to bed, you can choose not to go to work. But the consequences of your choices, you don't get to pick. For example, if the, the, if the, the highway says the maximum speed is 70 miles an hour and you decide to do 120, now, if the police officer stops you, you have made a choice to speed 120 miles an hour, but the consequences the police officer gives onto you is made by the, by the law, not by you. Choices and decisions in the heat of the moment informs us of who we really are. What is our motives? God will try you and test you to make sure that he can truly trust you. You won't give the key to the house of a man you don't trust. You won't give the key of the stall house to the man you don't trust. So why do you think God will give to you something, somebody that he doesn't trust? Now, let me move on as I begin to close the sermon for this morning. In the books of Psalm 34, verse 10, we know the scripture, a very common one. It said, Though the long, young lion do lack, or lack and suffer hunger, but those that seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. You and I are seeking the Lord. We will not lack any good thing in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Have faith in God that He is able to provide. Is Jehovah Jireh. He always provides for His own. In 1, Peter, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, he says, A man that does not look after his own is worse than an infidel, and he himself denies the faith. God is our Father, according to Matthew 6, verse 9. He says, Surely he will provide. He will provide for your needs. Trust him. He will provide. Have the faith of Abraham. Have the faith in God that he will provide. Regardless of whatever it looks like right now, regardless of whatever you're facing right now, God will provide. So have that confidence and assurance that you don't have to compromise because God will provide. You know, uh, allow me to use this, this statement. Um, some time ago there were some documentaries being done about young women who often sell their bodies for money. And when they are asked, they are asked that they live in abject poverty and they have no means. Their father and their mother cannot provide for them. And as a result of that, they have to prostitute themselves. And I began to think about it. I say, I wish, how I wish you, were, you would know God as your father. Even if your biological father does not provide. Your heavenly father is more than capable. So God will provide. The moment you know him as your father... Know that he has the responsibility over your life to provide for your needs. And he will not leave you, neither forsake you. Number two, please be obedient to his instructions. The greatest key to blessing that I have discovered in the scripture, according to Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 14, is to obey God. The smartest way to outsmart the devil is to obey God. Walk in obedience and you will see obstacles fall before you. See, the devil deliberately will want to force you on the path that does not lead to right, uh, lead to uh, lead to life. Rather, he wants to force you by mounting obstacles. But you know, as Zerubbabel said, he said, "This, this, this, who are thou, O mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou shall become a plain." Don't allow the devil to force you using mountains and challenges to take the path, the broad path that leads to destruction. Matthew seven fourteen. He will provide. I have that assurance that God will provide. Now, let me begin to close the sermon. My time is far spent. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request unto God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guide your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. God is a provider, He is the one that sustains the world. Is the one that releases the blessings upon the land and causes the ground to yield abundance. So except God keeps a house, the Lord watchman watch it in vain. God can shut the heaven and there will be no rain. God can make the ground black, brass and there will be no, no yielding of harvest. And then what will we do? Something that really strikes me is the story of Isaac as I begin to close. Isaac was a man or the son of the patriarch um, Abraham, the one that was meant to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. And then, um, 
The land was in famine and in jeopardy. And God told him to stay in the same land. Genesis 26. And the Bible says he reaped a hundredfold in that same year. Even though there was famine. Because God provided. May I decree it into your life this week. That as you go forth. May you experience supernatural abundance. In the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for you in the name that's above every name. Wherever you go to. You will experience God's your sufficiency. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The blessings of God that makes rich and have no sorrow shall be your portion. You will go from blessings to blessings to blessings in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I decree that what God has given unto you shall not be lost to devour us in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, let me decree the final blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word as comfort with life and power this morning. We thank you because you are a great provider. And I pray for all your children all over the world listening to me at this hour. That whatever it is that's causing them to lose sleep. Because they have not seen your provision. I pray that this week it will be turned to a testimony. As they go forth, may they enter into the blessings of God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I decree the weak blessed. Wherever you go, the Lord will supply all your needs according to the riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And I pray again in the name of above every name. That this week you will not walk into the trap of the enemy. Your footsteps shall be ordered. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that God will make a way for you where there seems to be no way. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. It is well with you, spirit, and body. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Please enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you tonight for the Bible study. As we begin to ex examine this topic in depth. To the glory and praise of his name. If you'd like to give your offerings and your thoughts, please visit our website, which is www.litwick.org. And or go on our um at the end of the of this of the sermon, there's um, the the bank details of the of the account of the ministry, and you can do a bank transfer if you so wish. God bless you. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Good day to you. Bye bye.